Welcome to the DAC meeting of October 14th, 2020. The time is 9 a.m. And um, first on the agenda is a call to order. Roll call and pledge of allegiance. Ms. Hope. Roger Jansen. Present. Nick Miedelich. Here. Brian Chekis. Here. Stephen Graham. Here. Michael Cuevas. Here. Brad McPherson. Let the record reflect that Brad McPherson is not present. Johnny Lee is on. Here. Gabriel, Gregory Gabriel. Let the record reflect that Gregory Gabriel is not present. Thank you, Hope. Mm -hmm. And now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands and under God. With liberty and justice. <laughs> okay, next is the approval of the minutes from June 10th, 2020. Are there any comments on the meeting minutes or any uh, concerns? If not, I'll look for a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Hearing motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 The vote. Let the record show the approval of the minutes was unanimous. Next on the agenda is a report from the urban designer, Mesa Ponte. Good morning, board members. Um, happy to have you uh, back again to DAC. Uh, we are continuing with uh, the board on a virtual format until um, the commission and the mayor decide to move us uh, back in um, in-person meeting. The city commission already started in-person meetings uh, early October, so we'll be waiting for um, an order from uh, the mayor, probably maybe end of uh, November. Possibly we'll have our um, DAC meeting maybe in December. We're not sure. We'll let you know. Um, another announcement that I want to um, say today is David Felton uh, has resigned from the board. He uh, served as a board member for three years, and we just want to say thank you for his um, participation as a board member. So we have now uh, one vacancy in the board, and we'll be working with administration to fill that. That's all I have for today. Great. Thank you. Next is remarks by the chairperson. Roger, if you're still on, do you have any uh, remarks before you have to? No, I don't at the time. Thank you, though. You're welcome. Next is declaration of ex parte communication. Has there been any ex parte communication from the board members with the applicants? No. None. No. None. No, I have uh, not had any either, so it sounds like uh, there has been no ex parte communications. Next item is the public hearing portion of the meeting. First item is the swearing in of the speakers. John, can I turn it over to you for that? So, Nick, we're going to oh, swear hi, in. Hi. We're going to swear in speakers um, before the third case. That's the only quasi judicial case on your agenda today. So, before we hear that TBR case, we'll swear everyone in because right now, all the participants um, are just in the waiting room watching. But if you'd like, Hope can go ahead and read um, the other information that we need to provide as far as public participation goes into the record. Sure, thank you. Hope. Mm -hmm. Pursuant to Executive Order 20-69 issued by the Office of Governor Ron DeSantis on March 20th, 2020, and Mayor Keith A. James's Executive Order Number 2020-05, issued on April 2nd, 2020, the City of West Palm Beach's boards and committees are conducting meetings through media technology 
and have released the requirements to have a quorum of its members physically present at City Hall. On April 14, 2020, Mayor Keith A. James's Executive Order Number 2020-09, which specifically provides the rules of procedure for conducting city meetings, including requirements for quasi-judicial hearings. To ensure the ability for the public to continue to participate in this hearing, it is being streamed live and available for viewing in the City Commission Chambers located at City Center 401 Clematis Street, provided that social distancing is required. Additionally, for those wishing to access the meeting remotely, they are able to do so directly through the applicable Zoom webinar link, as well as the city's usual media channels, including WPB TV 18, the city's website, and the city's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter feeds. Anyone from the public who would like to provide comment on an agenda item is able to do so through the following. Number one, in the city center, Flagler Gallery. Number two, dialing 561-320-6599 and leaving a voicemail not to exceed three minutes. Number three, sending an email or video recording to DAC DAC, public comment at WPB.org or completing the online public comment form at www.wpb.org forward slash public comments. Those accessing the meeting directly through Zoom may also use the chat or raise hand features. Anyone using only their phone may raise their hand by pressing star nine. Regardless of method, please be sure to indicate the agenda number or case number for which you are providing comment. Everyone providing testimony must have video capability and will need to be sworn in. We will do so at the start of each case on the agenda. If you are about to provide testimony and were not sworn in, please be sure to indicate such and be sworn in accordingly. Finally, after the applicant presents their case, staff will provide a presentation then the public will have an opportunity to speak or have their comments read into the record from previously received correspondence. The board will then go into executive session. Prior to rending the decision, the board will confirm no additional public comments have been received by staff. Thank you, Hope. Welcome. Okay, next is B, continued cases. I don't think there's any continued cases. So we're on to C, code revision cases. CRC 20-4, a request by Harvey E. Oyer III of Schutz and Bowen LLP on behalf of N Railroad Commercial LLC for an amendment to chapter 94, article four, downtown master plan section 94-105 use requirements in table 4-2, permitted use table for DMP in table 4-3, permitted use table for DMP in section 94-124, industrial chic district table 4-28, building requirements ICD-5, and table 4-29, building requirements ICD-2, to modify permitted uses within the Industrial Chic District 5 and Brelsford Park District R and remove the density limitations within the ICD. The subject districts are located within the downtown master plan area within Commission District Number 3, Commissioner Christy Fox. And with that, I believe I can turn it over to Harvey. Uh, good morning. Do I need to be sworn in? No, this is a code revision case, so it's not quasi judicial. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Nick. Good morning. Uh, so uh, here I, I have with me uh, our clients, Ned Grace and Joe first, and uh, Joe's going to make part of the presentation. So why don't I uh, sort of set the table for it? I'll describe the particular uh, request that we're making uh, before DAC this morning, and then I'll allow Joe to expand on his vision, which I think you're going to want to 
to here. So um, Joe has control of the slide. So Joe, I ask if we could move to the next slide. First, let me orient everyone to the geography that we're uh, talking about. It is the area that is bounded by the Florida East Coast Railroad on the west, Dixie Highway on the east, 11th Street on the north, and Quadrille on the south. And it's um, unfortunately been a long neglected area of our downtown. Uh, it uh, is maybe one of the few districts in our DMP that has experienced little to no uh, development, redevelopment uh, during the last 10 year run in um, what's been historically one of our best real estate cycles ever. Uh, next slide, please. In particular, we're talking about two uh, different sub districts. In green is ICD-5, which is industrial chic, limited at five stories. Uh, and that is basically the west side of Railroad Re Avenue, the east side of the FEC. Uh, it is uh, generally all warehouses. Uh, and the uh, Brelsford Park District R, which is in the light blue to the east. And that many, many years ago was uh, predominantly residential over time, of course. Uh, a lot of that is transitioned to from single family to multifamily to vacant to professional office. So it's um, sort of a, a mixture of a lot of things uh, still maintains some of its residential character. And then you can see that the Brelsford Park District residential is wrapped uh, in a liner on Dixie Highway uh, in purple by Brelsford Park District 5. And those are the generally commercial buildings on the west side of Dixie Highway. We're not proposing any amendments to that, uh, but I think that gives you a feel for the sub-districts in this neighborhood. So that's our current zoning map. We're not proposing to change any of those colors. What we're proposing are several text amendments to make these properties more usable, which we believe is uh, partially the reason why we have not seen any uh, redevelopment or repurposing or very much economic activity uh, at all since the industrial chic zoning uh, was created by Zaskovich, whatever that was, 13, 14, 15 years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the particular zoning requests. Uh, we are seeking text amendments to ICD-5, which again is the green one, the warehouses along the railroad, uh, to allow uses to be by right. Uh, pr the current regulations limit the uses to design arts related uses only, which is note P5 in the code, uh, which is very limiting, uh, obviously, for any new users. Uh, and uh, P12, uh, one of the other notes in the code, for example, limits restaurants to 75 seats. Not sure what the public policy reason was. My best guess, and I think it's an accurate guess because I sat on the city's DMP committee when this was adopted, was we quite frankly never had a vision for this area ever being anything other than what it was, which is a warehouse district along the railroad. So I, I think we created um, uses and uh, sub-district language around what was historically there more so than a vision for what it could be in the future. Um, with respect to the Brailsford Park District R, it is to our text amendment request is to allow offsite accessory surface parking only on the vacant properties and only on the properties with frontage on railroad and spruce and only if that parking is accessory to the uses across the street on the west side of Railroad Avenue and the ICD-5. So let, let me state that a different way because that's sort of long and confusing. On the west side of North Railroad Avenue is basically all warehouses and no parking. So if we repurpose those for any other expanded uses, which is the first part of our request, there's nowhere to park the people that we hope, hope show up to those 
new expanded uses. The solution to that is to take the parking lots and parking storage facilities that are on the east side of Railroad Avenue that are already there today. So they already look like parking lots, even though a couple of them are just storage facilities for the warehouses uh, and turn those into proper surface parking lots with appropriate buffering, landscaping, striping, uh, you know, compatible with the code uh, parking areas. It, that on its own would be an improvement, uh, but it will then allow us to park what we hope will be the expanded uses on the west side of the road. So in a nutshell, those are the two requests. In order to accomplish them, uh, we are uh, changing the language or proposing to change the language in the P5 note, as you'll see at the bottom, which is a strike through, and then adding off-site accessory parking lot will be permitted when accessory to use is located within the ICD-5, which means on the west side of Railroad Avenue. And those surface parking lots need to comply with the following three requirements. Accessory parking lots will be permitted only on vacant properties, so we cannot tear down any existing structures that are presently there in order to create new parking. It has to have frontage along Railroad Avenue or Spruce Avenue. The purpose of that, folks, is so that we do not encroach with surface parking into the interior of the Brailsford Park residential area, meaning we do not create any new adverse impacts for the residential that remains in that neighborhood. Uh, when located in a residential subdistrict, surface parking lots will not be required to comply with the minimum setback required for the district. And number three, surface parking lots shall comply with all landscape requirements included in section 94443C, except that divider medians shall be required only when more than four consecutive rows of parking are provided. We're going to graphically illustrate this for you because I know that's uh, hard to visualize, but effectively these um, non-conforming parking and storage lots that are there today will be made conforming with section 94443C with setbacks, buffers, walls, uh, uh, landscape islands, et cetera. Next slide, please. This reflects our requested text changes as illustrated in the tables for the subdistrict. So let's first look at ICD-5, which is the left highlighted column. Uh, these are the changes that we've requested. So the live work is no longer restricted by P5. And to remind you, P5 limited everything to only accessory to design arts related uses. And there clearly are not enough or any design arts related uses in this district because we're now on a decade and a half of no redevelopment, no repurposing. So if we delete the P5 and make it permitted by right, now we can have any type of live work in the ICD-5 district, whether it's design arts related or not. Similarly, under the commercial, uh, ground floor retail was limited only to design arts related. We propose to make that permitted by right. And the P21, so it'd become a P for permitted by right and P21. P21 for your information is light industrial uses may be allowed when associated with a retail component that occupies a minimum of 20% of the tenant space. So let me give you an example of that. You wanna have a retail bakery, for example, but part of it is industrial. You're selling your baked goods um, off-site. Uh, this allows both of those to be utilized uh, in the same location. A coffee house where they grind coffee that is sold off premises, but they also have a retail coffee house at the front of the house. That's what this P21 would permit. Under office, again, uh, it would morph it from office related to design arts only to any type of office. Uh, the restaurant, uh, same thing, any type of restaurant would be permitted and the P12 
would be deleted. The P12 was the 75 seat or 75 patron restriction, which seems to have no apparent public policy reason. I just think no one ever thought there would be a restaurant that would want to be there any larger than that. Uh, and in the other commercial, uh, again, removing the design arts limitation and making it permitted by right. Uh, the parking at the very bottom, you see that will become the new proposed P5 language that allows the offsite accessory parking with the three limitations uh, that I just went through in detail, has to be serving ICD-5, has to have frontage on Spruce or North Railroad, has to comply with 94443C. So those are the requests that we made. You'll notice in the paragraph the second paragraph at the right, that for code consistency purposes, the city staff has pro proposed that the same amendment language also be applied to ICD-2. So this was not our request. This is the city staff's request, which we completely agree with. We're also correcting a typo in the code. This table had always said ICD-5 on the left and ICD-3 on the right, there's no such thing as ICD-3, and there never was. So this was a wrong number in the column heading in the code all these years, which again speaks to how little activity has occurred in this district in 10 or 15 years when no one even noticed that it labeled the district incorrectly. That's how little activity we've had here. So that will correct it along with making ICD-2 compatible with ICD-5. Again, that's a staff request and, and we agree with it. Uh, next slide, please. The proposed amendment to the table for the Brelsford Park District R, which is the residential, not the purple liner on Dixie Highway, is to add the P5 uh, proposed language to the offsite accessory parking and again, this is the requirement that it only serve ICD-5 uses, have frontage along Spruce, have frontage along North Railroad, uh, and comply with the other code requirements uh, for a parking lot. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the standards uh, that you must consider in uh, considering our request for text amendment under section 94-32A uh, you must consider these uh, eight rezoning standards. I'm delighted to go through them with you individually, but uh, we believe we meet them and staff concurs. So in the interest of time, I, I won't go through them individually. Next slide, please. So the applicant respectfully requests of DAC a recommendation of approval to the city commission of the zoning and land development regulation text changes uh, they comply with all the amendment standards in section 9432A. Uh, we conducted a, a neighborhood meeting via Zoom with the community. Uh, we had uh, actually more participation than I anticipated. I don't remember the, the number of people, but I'd say it was in the neighborhood of 20, which is kind of extraordinary in a neighborhood that does not have a lot of home ownership. It did have the participation of most of the commercial owners and, uh, and warehouse owners along Railroad Avenue. And um, not wanting to speak for them, but uh, it sounded like there was a general support for moving in this direction. Uh, Anna Maria can probably address that more specifically. And we're proud to have staff recommendation for approval. Uh, next slide, please. This is where I am going to stop and try to answer any sort of technical questions that you have. And after I've done that, uh, hopefully to your satisfaction, uh, then I'm going to introduce uh, one of my two clients uh, to share with you their broader vision for the neighborhood, which I think you would like to have the context of, you know, why are we making these request, what is it they propose to do in this neighborhood, which I think you'll find uh, very interesting and exciting. So why don't I pause here, Mr. Chair, and um, see if any of your members have questions. Sure. Thank you, Harvey. Does any board member have any technical questions or uh, 
questions relative to what we just heard? Hearing none, I think we can move on to uh, the next part of the presentation. Oh. Mr. Chair, yes, can I ask yes. yes, sir. Mr. Weir, um, not familiar with the east side of the of railroad. Um, does the city own any property uh, or any lots um, along that stretch? You know? I don't know that I have the exact answer. If they do, it's minimal. Um, I believe all of the west side is privately owned and all of the east side is privately owned. However, when you get to the very north end of it, I think there's a few vacant lots that could be owned by the city or CRA. Um, Anna Maria may know better. And, and that could be a question that Anna can, can answer. The reason why I'm saying that is I'm wondering if there's opportunities, not knowing what, what's coming in terms of presentation by your, by your client, but are there opportunities to maybe cons uh, consolidate some of those uh, properties and do some kind of parking structure and activate the east side. Uh, if the west side is gonna activate with all these new uses, instead of having all just parking across the way, consolidate some of them so we can get some built structure on, 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 the, on the east side uh, to kind of counter play off of the west side. And once we see the presentation, might get more more of a more clarity, but this, is there an opportunity to consolidate and get some of that service parking lot gone and have some kind of shared parking garage that everyone benefits you know, along that strip. So, um, you know, excellent question. And I think that gets really to my client's presentation of what we hope will be needed here in the future should this experiment by my clients be successful. Um, at this point, you, you know, it's a big risk for them. They don't know if this will be a successful undertaking. So an investment in structured parking would be premature at the moment. But if it is successful, I think that's exactly where it needs to go in the future is not burn all of this valuable property on the east side with surface parking, but to structure it and, and share it um, with other uses in the neighborhood. Um, I, we're not there yet, but that presumably is where we would like to be in a few years. Thanks, Mr. Royer. If it looks like anything else, like uh, place project stuff, uh, bring it on. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I had a question just in terms of, you know, offsite improvements and offsite parking. It sounded like, you know, if there's businesses on the west side of the road and there's vacant land or parking that's on the east side of the road, that that would be upgraded or brought up to code with landscaping, buffers, irrigation walls, et cetera. If that's on someone else's property that is serving another person's property, how does that work in terms of uh, you know physical improvements, landscaping, irrigation, electric uh, pump stations to do that if it's sort of that kind of arrangement? Is that a question I, I clear? Speak. Yeah, Harvey, would you like me to speak to that? Yeah, so um, do you want to do that now, Joe, or does that get covered in your presentation? It, it primarily does. I think it's probably best if we continue on in the presentation, because I think it's going to address a lot of the comments, or at least the two comments that have come up so far. So wh why don't we do that, Nick, with your permission, if uh, Joe is going to cover it. Um, let me take a moment and introduce you to my clients, um, and they're both on the, uh, on the call. Uh, Ned Grace. Uh, and Joe first. And they both have significant development background. Uh, Ned has uh, quite a, a bit of footprint in Palm Beach County already with a number of projects, properties, hotels, restaurants that you would be familiar with. Major investor in our community, uh, lives in our community. In fact, his office is in this neighborhood. Made a very large financial commitment to this neighborhood. Um, in terms of properties already acquired and properties under contract. Uh, so this is not, uh, you know, a, a speculative or theoretical discussion. Uh, they're already fully committed in the neighborhood. Uh, and Joe first, uh, who lives in Miami, and Joe's going to make the presentation. And Joe has um, significant and remarkable experience in similar projects. The one that I'll call to your attention, because I think that 
we can all readily identify with it and it, it might help you visualize uh, what the idea is here, is Joe was one of the principals uh, in uh, Wynwood in Miami. And uh, if you're familiar with Wynwood, it was a very similar, in fact, worse condition warehouse district in Olvertown, underutilized. And uh, Joe and his partners went in and didn't build more height, didn't tear down the existing building stock. They repurposed it with unique uh, food and beverage offerings, entertainment, arts, culture. It's received national and global recognition uh, for radically transforming that neighborhood. Um, on a much smaller scale, and I think a much better scale, that's what this area is in our city, an underutilized uh, warehouse district uh, that is a couple of blocks from the heart of our downtown that presents a really unique opportunity for a developer with um, the vision and the capacity to do this. And that's what this team offers. So uh, without going in, any further to Joe's remarkable pedigree, I, I feel privileged that he wants to come to our community and uh, replicate, albeit differently, uh, his success in other parts of the country. So uh, Joe, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, uh, thank you, Harvey. Um, and thank you um, everybody here for the time and consideration. Um, Harvey's remarks are, are probably too flattering for me, but um, the, the, the basic background here is uh, my, my colleague and now business partner, Ned Grace, um, had been working on assembling um, most of these properties. So we control most of the west side of Railroad Avenue and virtually all of the east side of Railroad Avenue um, and was working on some ideas on how to create life and vibrancy and really bring these old industrial buildings back to life because for the most part, um, these buildings are vacant um, and, and, and extremely underutilized. Fortunately, Ned and I were introduced through a mutual friend. Um, really, when I, when I the first time I came and, and sort of turned on to North Rail and saw this amazing opportunity of this, you know, relatively short street. Um, surely it's vehicular, but really could be pedestrian in nature, given the fact that North Road Avenue is not a connecting thoroughfare. It's it's you know a very short run street. To me, the opportunity seemed tremendous to create something differentiated um, and really exciting for West Palm Beach where clearly in my view, there wasn't something that was comparable to this. So very simplistically, our, our vision here is to unlock the potential of the underutilized predominantly vacant buildings and to enhance the pedestrian experience and commercial offerings for the immediate residential air, area and broader West Palm Beach market. For us, and in terms of what, what I do in a, a core practice is really about content creation and, and trying to create vibrancy through exciting uses and destinations. So for us, there's a few very simplistic elements here to, to bring this to life. Um, the first would be create a vibrant and multi-use commercial core on North Railroad Avenue. Um, as Harvey mentioned through the presentation, there are a series of limitations um, that would prevent us from doing that in the, in the underlying code. And clearly over the last 15 years, those, those restrictions haven't led to the type of growth um, and development that I think that the city was probably pushing for at the time. Um, Great question on parking. So we do view parking as a sort of a first phase and then hopefully an eventual second phase. But as you'll see when we go deeper in the presentation, we have uh, uh, all vacant parcels on the east side of Railroad Ave. Some are used for storage lots and some are used for um, parking, but they're, they're not you know, permitted to code parking lots. So for us, um, clearly we would love to have a two-sided commercial core, but we have a way to create some of that through what we've been thinking in terms of our parking plan. So that'll get addressed in a moment. Um, and then of course, um, enhance the landscape and open green space opportunities along the east side of Railroad Ave. So that also ties into the parking, even pre-COVID and of course more um, sort of noticeable, you know, post-COVID is the idea of having open space and, and, and you know, being able to really work with public realm. As you can see in this image, most of these buildings are zero lot line buildings. Um, you know, they abut each other immediately to the sides. Um, right now, the sidewalk conditions are, are frankly poor along the, uh, you know, the frontage of the buildings. And then there's some area behind the buildings abutting the FEC, but there's not a host of area for people to congregate outdoors. Um, and we think we can create that through our, our parking plan. So this is a uh, real life, you know, as of, uh, <laughs> you know, a few weeks ago image. 
Um, you can see obviously the, the vacant buildings, but this image more focus is to is to really look at the east side of the road. So you can see there, you know, there is striping on some of the lots here. We have, you know, storage here. And then again, this is more, you know, parking and storage and another vacant parcel. So, you know, we, we control these parcels to the east. So to answer your question about, you know, the various control elements, it was important to us to ensure that, you know, we could use the parking lots on the east side for sort of any of the parcels on, on the west side and their redevelopment. Um, we have the ability to provide really ample parking, I think, for our first phase of, of life and, and kind of, you know, value creation here. Um, and then hopefully this is successful and we're, you know, we're working on broader plans down the road that would include things such as structured parking and, and future development. But what we've created here, um, we are very excited about. Uh, we've also spoken to the CRA and, and worked with planning staff hand in hand on this idea which is to create a linear park that fronts East Railroad um, with the parking sort of recessed behind that. So these are the three lots that I just showed you in the, in the previous image. And the thought process here is that since we don't have the ability to provide parking and to also provide um, structures and buildings on the east side of Railroad Avenue, we want to create a linear park for, uh, I think, a series of obvious reasons. We want to have an assembly area where people can congregate we also want to be able to activate portions of the of the you know, open space with other commercial activities, whether it's, you know, a small food cart, popsicle cart, uh, small events, things of that nature. Um, and the beauty of what we've done here is that we found this parking plan that works within the city's guidelines um, and, and Anna Maria and planning staff and city staff has been very helpful sort of walking us through this and making sure that we can get this to be code compliant while at the same time delivering an amazing public realm opportunity um, along Railroad Avenue. Another really, I think, important thing to note is Railroad Avenue, as I mentioned, really only has vehicular traffic that is coming specifically for the buildings. Nobody uses that as a thoroughfare. This is not like being on, on Dixie. So the ability to cross back and forth um, is relatively simple. Um, and of course, as we sort of evolve the plan, we would love to get to a place where uh, at certain times and for certain events, we, we close a portion of the road so that we can have a very sort of free flow of people from one side of the street to the other. Um, and you know, the, the basic text amendments that are in front of you are really the first phase to bringing all of these things to life. In terms of what we're thinking from a tenancy perspective is we want to make this a really incredible mixed use, but still primarily residential enclave type of neighborhood. Um, in order to do that, we wanna, again, adaptively reuse those buildings to bring in cafes, coffee shops, creative office, and really sort of continue a lot of the things that I did in Wynwood that I'm most proud of, um, which are, you know, the capitalizing and, and bringing to life the Zach the Bakers of the world and the Panther Coffees of the world to really give the West Palm uh, local food and beverage entrepreneurs and other, you know, creative entrepreneurs a playground to create and to perform. Um, and frankly, we think that the, the building types um, and again, this, this uh, you know, park feature that we've created along North Railroad really distinguishes us and gives us a better opportunity to, to create that type of environment and bring in these types of users. Um, I'll speak a little bit about me and then Ned, you can jump in about NDT, but um, as Harvey mentioned, so I was the managing partner for a company called Goldman Properties um, in Miami and redeveloping Wynwood. I was managing partner with them for 10 years. I've been working in Wynwood for the last 13 years. Um, the one thing Harvey didn't mention is that I also created and chaired the business improvement district in Wynwood, which was the policy creation vehicle for all of the planning and zoning work, as well as the clean, safe and marketing that typical business improvement districts do. Um, I, I left Goldman Properties in 2018 to form my own firm. Um, and primarily what I do are, are larger scale, multi-asset neighborhood re revitalization and rejuvenation projects. Um, I'm working on one as well in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, I have some interesting work in Doral um, here in Miami um, and also just opened a uh, 22,000 square foot food and beverage um, sort of assembly ecosystem in Doral. Um, I'm partners in the Wynwood Yard business, which we just opened our second location in Doral called the Doral Yard. Um, was, one of the gentlemen mentioned, I guess, had visited my website. Um, I also have been involved in much larger scale developments, such as the Wynwood Garage, which is exactly what you described, a centralized parking facility in Wynwood that serves 
um, the greater Winwood area. Um, that's a 430 space, eight story project that I was the last project I built with Goldman Properties. And I'm currently the local development partner for 545 Wynn, which is a 300,000 square foot office building in Wynwood um, with Sterling Bay out of Chicago. Um, so thank you that that's um, my portion of the presentation. And Ned, if, if you'd like to give some more background on NDT, uh, feel free to take it away. Yeah, sure. Uh, Ned Grace here. I um, ND is a, sort of a fully functional real estate investment and development firm. We're based here in West Palm. Uh, we just built an office that sits on Dixie Highway between 10th and 11th Street. Um, so we're immersed in this neighborhood. Uh, we've done a sort of a, a mix of projects throughout the West Palm market um, and, the, and the greater Palm Beach County market. Um, everything from retail, hospitality, office um, and residential. Um, we sort of got our start as um, small multifamily uh, investors and developers uh, with a focus on West Palm. And we own and operate a management company that manages all of our assets. Um, and we also have a development side that, um, you know, that, that works on these larger um, scale development projects. So when we, uh, when we started sort of identified this neighborhood as a, as a target, um, you know, we looked for the best and the brightest um, in neighborhood redevelopment. And, you know, Joe was, you know, hands down the, the most qualified um, and most experienced in, in that space. Joe's, you know, a, a lawyer by trade as well and, and has a lot of um, significant um, and, and relevant experience in the curation of um, tenants and, and policy generally. So, um, you know, we're delighted to have Joe as a partner. We, we believe that the West Palm market, you know, deserves, uh, you know, curated uh, content. And we think that, you know, the current you know, commercial content uh, is a bit fragmented, and we hope that we can create a, a special neighborhood for um, you know the residents of this market and you know and other local markets uh, around here to visit and and enjoy. So, that's that's sort of it. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. And would you guys like me to stop the screen share so we can go back to the uh, sort of panel grid, or what, what would you prefer? Yeah, Anna, Mark, if you have a presentation. Yes, the staff has a presentation also um, to present um, the staff um, position on this amendment. So if you want, I can share my screen now Please. and do that part or unless Mr. Chair, you want to ask some questions to the applicant at this point? Uh, I think if you continue with yours, we'll have all the questions at the end. Perfect. Okay, so um, Harvey and Joe did an excellent job explaining all uh, their proposals and um, what the vision was. So I'm gonna go uh, more towards uh, our staff position. One thing that I wanted to mention is that um, the downtown master plan that was done in 2009 had um, a vision for this area. The industrial shake uh, was envisioned as a transitional uh, district where um, light industrial uses could coexist with um, residential and commercial uses. Uh, the, the image was to try to adapt and renovate the existing building stock that was these old uh, warehouses and some industrial uses because it was believed that they had a lot of character and a lot of potential. Uh, it was imagined uh, to reno be renovated as large working storefronts with maybe co-working spaces and warehouse style buildings. It was also, um, it stated at that point that the intention, because it was, this was um, imagined as an atypical area, it was intended to be uh, designer related uses. And, uh, and that was where the origin of this all amendment is. Um, it's clearly that after 10 years or more of the um, downtown master plan being implemented, the vision has not materialized. The structures are still vacant. Some, uh, some of them are or are still used as storage or industrial uses. So nothing has really happened in this district since the master plan uh, was updated or even before with the previous master plan has always been kind of this industrial area that does not really um, live well with the residential neighborhood on the um, east. 
And this is where we are right now, and this is why the applicant presented this proposed amendment. Um, they intend to um, do the renovations of this structure, and their vision really aligns very well with the original vision of the master plan to transform this structure in a more vibrant space with commercial uses and really create an attraction and utilizing the character that is so particular and really highlighted to the extreme possible. So the proposal to remove these design are related uses is definitely a good thing. It's, um, it's seen as just removing a restriction that was originally created to guide the district for particular use, but is in reality open it to uh, any other um, of the uses that are currently allowed, even within the uh, Breastford Park District 5 or the Urban Core. So the staff definitely supports this proposal to allow more flexibility on um, being able to promote further the renovation of the industrial uh, district as uh, it was presented with the vision from the outlet. Um, the renovation of the existing building stock with general office and commercial uses will accomplish in terms of the district, as I mentioned. We don't see that um, allowing, for example, the designer related uses, restricted uh, office uses uh, for uh, uh, architects or landscape architects or artists. In this case, we we're going to open it to allow other office uses like lawyers. So lawyers could be fun also and cool. So we think it's uh, can be definitely be part of the district vision and um, be um, incentive incentivize the district. So allowing the flexibility will definitely help uh, the developer. And if the vision is uh, following the downtown, um, we support it fully. As they explained, Joe did a great job, and this is definitely in line with the vision that was originally planned for the 2009 update. So having this. A uh, mix of uses with some residential, some coffee shops, some offices, possibly a hotel at some point. Um, those uses will definitely be compatible with the neighborhood and definitely highlight the character of this area in the downtown. It will be an asset for the entire city. Uh, the second proposed amendment that they are requesting uh, is regarding the um, service parking lot within the Breastford Park District. As you know, um, the code is very strict on uh, service parking lots within the residential districts because we want to definitely protect the fabric of the residential environment. So um, we have worked with the applicant based on this request and we understand the need for parking for the industrial uh, uses. If uh, anything is to happen with the redevelopment of those buildings, parking will be uh, necessary and, uh, and need to function. So we work with them on trying to accommodate, as they propose, the parking on the east side of uh, Railroad Avenue. There are existing um, empty lots, um, and we have worked with the applicant on uh, modifications to the language that they propose to ensure and mitigate the, any possible negative impacts that a surface parking could have in the residential system. As Harvey mentioned, we put specific restrictions that says that it's only accessory to uses within the industrial district five and only for lots facing Railroad Avenue and Spruce Avenue. So we don't want these surface parking lots to start to encroach into the residential neighborhood. We also include a specific restrictions that do not allow the demolition of the structures uh, for the construction of the surface parking lots. This is a, a requirement that exists in general in the downtown is not allowed anywhere in the downtown, but we uh, decided to put it even again in here to really uh, reinforce that concept. And also we work with the applicant to ensure that any proposed landscape um, surface parking will comply with any of the requirements of surface parking lots as any other uh, lot in the um, in the city or in the in the downtown area. The only thing that we allow some flexibility was the requirement for a median every three rows of parking because of the configuration of these lots. They are not deep enough to add a median um, buffer, a landscape buffer in the middle of the um, three rows of parking. So uh, that was the only thing that uh, we uh, removed. But the rest, the surface parking includes all the requirements uh, for landscape and and buffers that are uh, required for any other surface parking lot. So they will have the perimeter buffer with sh uh, shade trees around it and a fence that will um, when they are adjacent to a residential structure. <coughs> Um, so we believe the new surface parking, if associated with the uses uh, within the industrial shake district, will represent a substantial improvement to the current conditions. The properties on the east side of Railroad Avenue, as you can see in these pictures, are currently used for outdoor storage and uh, even some um, as uh, not authorized parking. They're not, um, some of the cases, well maintained and they do not represent an asset for uh, the community or the neighborhood. 
So we think any improvement um, will be um, beneficial for the project. These are the uh, properties that will really be allowed to have surface parking lots. As you can see, are only the properties facing Railroad Avenue. So it's basically up to um, 100 feet from the neighborhood, some places even uh, more shallow, and do not allow the demolition of any structures uh, that exist to construct surface parking lots. Uh, one last uh, amendment that was proposed, actually it was not proposed by the applicant, but it was suggested by staff, and it's um, regarding the existing density limitations for the Industrial Shake District 5 and Industrial Shake District. And uh, we are suggesting, uh, taking advantage of these um, cycle of uh, amendments to remove the density limitations that are currently in these two districts. The Industrial Shake District 5 has a density limitation of 40 dwelling units per acre, and the Industrial Shake District 2 has a density limitation of 20 dwelling units per acre. We are suggesting to remove uh, these uh, two uh, density limitations and allow uh, the market to have uh, more flexibility to determine how many units are, are placed in each of the, of the projects and what is the size of those units. This is uh, very consistent with the same um, requirements that we have for the urban core or any other special districts. Um, the industrial district district is actually was the only special uh, district that included density limitations. Density limitations in the downtown were only reserved for the residential uh, subdistricts. So uh, removing these, it makes this district consistent with the other uh, special districts on the urban core. We have noticed that in the other areas of the downtown, these give flexibility to the developers to uh, work their project according with the market demands. And uh, still the FAR limitations are in place. So it's not that they will be able to have any additional development capacity on the sites, but it's more a matter of allowing the flexibility to have smaller units if they need, or have a combination. Um, there still is our restrictions regarding the average unit size that is 800 square feet and minimal unit size in the downtown. There's also, we have the provisions of micro units. So these um, elements will allow uh, more flexibility to the developer, but it's still uh, within certain uh, limitations. So we think it's, it's um, reasonable to propose this. The applicant was okay with that. And uh, we're thinking already kind of on the next steps of this process, we see these as uh, the first phase of uh, redevelopment process of the Bradford Park and the industrial shake area that is in, uh, it's in, in, in need really for a lot of vacant land that has a lot of potential in the downtown. Um, staff uh, has reviewed the proposed amendments and worked with the applicant, as I say, on modifications in the proposed language, and that's the language that was presented today. Uh, based on that, staff recommends approval for the code revision case 2004 based on the, upon the findings that the proposed amendment complies with all the amendment standards found in section 9432 of the Sunny Land Development Regulation. The proposed amendments will be presented to the planning board on November 17 and subsequently uh, will be presented to the city commission in December. As Harvey said, we had a Zoom uh, or virtual community meeting um, last month with uh, the neighborhood. We have a uh, high turnout. Um, I think I was right around 20 people from the neighborhood uh, was uh, in attendance. Uh, in general, uh, the comments that we received were positive. Some of the uh, property owners of the industrial chic properties actually mentioned that they were really looking forward to this amendment to uh, kind of provide flexibility for the uses in the district because they had had uh, some issues finding tenants that uh, abide by the designer related uses and we had heard that before so we are happy to move this ahead. Um, we heard uh, one, a couple of comments from some of the residents that they were concerned with the traffic. So um, working with the applicant once they submit a for the specific surface parking lots permit, we'll work with them to try to direct the, um, the traffic for these parking lots towards Railroad Avenue and not having uh, cars go um, through the residential neighborhood. But that was the only uh, comment that we received. Um, the rest were positive and looking forward to the changes uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, that uh, concludes the staff presentation and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. John, is it time now for opening the public comment portion? Uh, that's up to you. I mean, whether you wanna do questions first or but we do have one speaker online who does wish to speak during public comments. So just whenever that time. 
I Chair? think if we could have that person give their input. Yes, sir. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. Just a quick question for I staff. Just, I'd um, say let's... Go ahead. Thanks. Just a quick question for staff. And Maria, it may be premature, but I'm just wondering, has any, as part of the redevelopment of the parking areas or kind of laying that out, has any consideration been given to undergrounding the overhead utilities that are located on the east side of railroad at this time? Um, not at this time. I mean, that definitely is um, a substantial investment. We think once uh, if uh, this uh, initial phase of development is successful, and, and I don't want to talk uh, um, for the developers, but I, I, I envision that once the first step is successful, they have acquired other properties in the in the neighborhood and a uh, more involved redevelopment process comes. If the lots on the east side of Railroad Avenue get developed, that will be part of, of it definitely because they are really um, an eyesore and will not be compatible with a new development on the east side of Railroad Avenue. So that probably and will come just, at some point. I just think that you know at some point we'd be we'd miss an opportunity if we didn't have that kind of built in baked into it at some point if plans come through or if some kind of um, you know, approvals are, are needed to make sure that we get that done so that just enhances whatever is happening out there and um, it's not a long stretch and they're, they're not high power it's not uh, you know major lines and it just seems uh, that it would just be it would add so much to it and create so much potential in the future especially for the parking area that's going to require shade trees for some of the screening they're going to be inhibited by that because of the existence of those power lines just kind of putting that out there from a design standpoint. Yep. And, and Brian, we agree very much with, with your comments. So, you know, that was part of the discussion that we had very early again with the CRA and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to come to, um, you know, a plan that, that accomplishes that very goal. Great. So, yeah, I think if we can hear from the gentleman in the uh, comments section and then we could uh, turn it over to the board uh, for questions and comments. Okay, I just brought in Al Malafato. Al, you'll just need to unmute and or start your video. Okay, well, I'm not sure if the video is working. So I'll That's just okay. speak. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. I'm Al Malafato with the law firm of Lewis, Longman & Walker. Um, first of all, a comment from a personal perspective as a long time business resident of downtown West Palm Beach. I'm excited to have a mini, Win mini Winwood coming to our community. I think that's exciting. But we do represent a current tenant on Railroad Avenue at 831 North Railroad Avenue, which is one of the buildings on the west side. And our client has an active art studio there. So Harvey, yes, there is some art, art activity within this district still. And we, we would like assurance from both staff and from the, uh, the uh, Ms. Oyer's clients that uh, these text changes will not adversely affect our clients continuing, continuing use and occupancy um, at his premises. I may answer that question, Mr. Chair. Uh, the current sure. changes in terms of uses are just removing the requirement for designer related uses. So that means that an art gallery or an art studio, it's, it's currently allowed, but it will continue to be allowed on their commercial uses or retail uses. So it's only removing the restriction that force um, any new uses to be designer related uses. So it's actually more flexible than what it is currently in the district. Thank you, Anna Maria, but I'd like to also hear from the, uh, from the applicant on that. Sure, Al, good morning. So good morning, Harvey. Um, you know, I'm only speculating um, who your client is and what their use is, but I think I know it's used as a private art studio and storage, correct? Correct. Yep. Um, and Anna Maria or Ned, Joe, please correct me if I go wrong, but Anna Maria gave the answer. Um, we're, we're not um, removing the right for your client's continued use. We're simply expanding the universe of other potential uses, uh, which um, your client had actually called me about. And I um, tried to explain that uh, his use can continue indefinitely 
uh, these proposed changes probably add value to his property uh, because it now uh, permits other uses. So uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, hopefully I am, but it has no adverse impact on your client's continued use as a, a private art gallery. Thank you, Harvey and, and Anna Maria. And, and that's great to get that on the record. Thank you very much. And Mr. Great. Chair, there is no additional public comment that I can see. Okay, John, thank you. M well, Mr. Mr. Vice yeah. Chair, if I could just answer Mr. Chekis's earlier question, the city owns no property south of 11th the 6th Street Dixie Highway to the FEC Railroad. Um, we own a small lot on the alley east of Spruce, just south of Palm Beach Lakes, but within the district we're talking today, um, there's nothing else that the city owns. Thanks, okay, Rick. Thank you. Great. Well, I think we could uh, throw it to the board here for some questions and comments. Who would like to go first? Um, I'll just bring, I'll make a brief comment. Um, look, uh, staff and the applicant, clearly you've all worked very well together on this. Um, you know, everyone's in agreement. I think you've, you've come up with a great outcome for an area that's, that's suffered from a lot of, you know, under, under investment for a long time. So um, I think it's, it's great to see that, you know, we're continuing to be adaptable to, to what's in our, DMP regulations and, and if we see something that's not working, we're, we're willing to, to consider changes that are appropriate that, that might, you know, further the intent of the DMP. So, um, you know, I just I just want to say congratulations to both staff and the applicant. I think you've, you've, you've come up with a, a, a great, great solution for this area. Great, thank you. So I had a comment just in terms of, I guess, you know, we're here to approve these changes, which I support as well. And I think uh, make a lot of sense here as we're looking at this area. So is, um, is I guess, maybe the plan or the sequence of events that this change happens, maybe the first tenant comes in that might be a brewery or a bakery or whatever uh, that tenant's going to be that business gets to use the parking areas on the east side and that creates some inertia or some some stimulus and then let's say that whole area gets developed ideally into a funky cool place that everybody loves to go to uh, with no real sort of maybe you know here's a city place type project we're putting forward and it has to go through all the uh, approvals is it is it more so again with that concept of working with the infrastructure working with everything once the parking is done can you simply you know open a business right away uh, under all the general uh, regulations that exist now and that sort of organically happens and you gain tenancy and vibrancy and it just expands or is it sort of a we're taking over assembling this area here's this new project that we're packaging up and it has to go through a huge or you know, lengthy approval process. Actually, Mr. Chair, um, the, the, anyone could at this point go and uh, renovate one of the existing structures in Railroad Avenue and not put a single parking space uh, for their use. Um, that is the code requirement right now. If you have existing structure and you are not adding any square footage, you can operate with whatever was the parking associated with that original structure. As we know, these buildings were built as warehouses with no parking. So if, let's say, I have one of the structures in there, I could come in, renovate it as, let's say, co-working space and have zero parking for that facility. So we think it's uh, it's uh, a very good idea to still, as the applicant was proposing, allow the construction of some parking to serve those uses because market-wise probably will not work with zero parking, but also we don't want the uh, overflow parking to uh, inundate the residential space. So they, uh, when they come and they build the parking across the street will be associated or accessory to the use on the west side, but um, it will basically will be a share facility for those uses on the west side. Okay. 
I guess I was just envisioning, you know, is is the plan uh, from a design standpoint to just leave everything, maybe, you know, power lines or utilities can be considered, but, you know, is the building facade going to stay where it is? Is that teeny sidewalk going to stay? Is the road going to stay? Or is that all sort of, you know, maybe envisioned as a, you know, um, outdoor pedestrian mall or, you know, some kind of concept that, which may be down the road at this point in terms, I'm just trying to get an idea of maybe what ultimately it's going to look like if anything different than the existing structures and curb line work today. Sure. I, I can speak to that. So, you know, the, the streetscape and public realm opportunity of North railroad is, is something that we think is a tremendous asset to the project. Um, so we, fortunately, here in Miami and Wynwood, um, I created a streetscape master plan, um, and one of the consultants we used was Architectonica Geo. We've been working with them to sort of think about very early conceptual ideas for the street, um, and having that dialogue as well with the with the CRA, as I mentioned earlier. So our hope would be that we actually have a a much more differentiated and compelling public realm than what you see there today. Great, thank you. Uh, and one last comment I had was just in terms of, you know, one of these special areas in our city is when you go up over the Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard Ridge and don't pass, right? It's a really unique sort of perspective that I always sort of remark at, and that's right at the sort of, I guess, north edge of this project, right? And so as you go up over that bridge, you have a beautiful sneak peek and view of our downtown and city. And I just wondered from a design perspective, does that come into play at all with your vision? If there's some kind of, I don't know, a district identity, I don't want to say sign, but it would be nice to sort of go up over that bridge as a visitor and understand there's a really cool funky area that I, I should not miss if I'm driving here in the city. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. As you may know, um, the county is working through um, bridge renovation and expansion plans. Um, currently, they're going to start doing public hearings, not public hearings, but public engagement. I think the date was in starting November. Um, so we'll obviously be a part of all those discussions and, and try to do something along the lines of what you just mentioned, because I think that makes a lot of sense. Great. Thank you. Um, Any other comments? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, uh, I mean, the uh, it's exciting as a resident of downtown. I've been living in downtown for ten years to see uh, another area um, potentially uh, get get this you know facelift. Um, you know, we've obviously seen the you know the Jefferson. I guess we call it the Jefferson District um, take off and uh, turn into something that continues to build uh, momentum. Uh, Industry Alley is obviously uh, another new area, you know, along these uh, railroad corridors that are, um, have been long, you know, as we discussed, uh, just haven't had a lot of changes. So it's it's exciting and, and to see, you know, the people that are involved in this with the pedigree that, you, that Joe and Ned, you have, um, you know, it just, uh, uh, it, it's, it's exciting. Um, I don't have any specific questions. Uh, I think the, the catalyst here is to try to, to activate uh, the area with, with I think, the, you know, the parking structure and uh, and uh, the linear park. And, and then, um, as I think Nick was asking, there's not going to be any um, greater design at this point to, to transform it, It'll, you know, each, each Warehouse will be um, looked at individually, trying to find the appropriate tenants for for each space. Um, I think that's that's what you're asking, Nick. For for the most part, there's um, not any grander vision that we're we're looking at at this point. Just to start with a linear park and a parking, and then that'll be the catalyst that'll that'll move some of this redevelopment forward. Is it? That's what we're discussing. Yeah, I think my question was just out of curiosity, more kind of the process of how how things would change if the end game is to have this beautiful uh, district or, you know, really interesting, intriguing place uh, that is there to go to. 
you know, how does that happen? Does it just sort of organically happen? You know, parking lot linear park first, pool first, very popular tenant, and that gets the next tenant and the next tenant and sort of grow from there as opposed to, you know, the whole thing gets torn up as a construction site, you know, new papers all come in or, you know, whatever. So I think, I think that's the vision if I, if I understood it correctly is a sort of, yeah, maybe organic. I can, uh, that, I, I can speak to that more specifically. So uh, our vision is again, the adaptive reuse of the existing, um, you know, commercial core, the buildings on the west side of the road and doing each of those buildings in their own differentiated uh, sort of style and aesthetic and of course programming those with tenants that that we believe are accretive to you know to the growth of the area um, my view on placemaking generally and and of course revitalization projects is you have to start somewhere and when you have a, a commercial core um, and, and an interesting building stock to start i think bringing that to life putting demand generating tenants there really acts as a catalyst to create vibrancy and then sort of working towards um, a, a broader vision and you know future development from that point. To me, the, the reason why we're here with these two, uh, what I believe to be relatively minor text amendments is that we have to start somewhere. And these are the first two things that need to change for us to start that, that process. I appreciate that. Is there anyone else that has any comments or questions on this case? No, but Mr. Chair, uh, let the record reflect that Gregory Gabriel has joined the meeting. Okay. Hi, Gregory. So at this point, um, I think I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Hearing a motion and a second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, let the record show that the case has passed unanimously. CRC 20-04. Thank you all Thank you, very everyone. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice Have presentation. Good luck with the project. Thank Bye. you so Thank much, you. folks. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to the next code revision case, CRC 20-05. This is a request by the city of West Palm Beach and Palm Beach County for an amendment to chapter 94, article four, downtown master plan, section 94-104, prior development approvals to modify the language regarding the length of time granted to replace a non-conforming structure destroyed by windstorm, flood, or natural disaster. The amendment would apply within the entire downtown master plan area within commission district number three, Commissioner Christy Fox. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and members of DAC. Uh, Rick Green, Development Services Director. I'll be presenting this case as well. Uh, so as you mentioned, this is a, uh, a request and really the the background that I'll provide today will also impact the second case, the TDR case that Liz Levesque will be presenting. Um, so they're both interrelated. I'll touch upon two, but then focus on the specific request. Um, but just to provide a little background, um, as the city was working toward the redevelopment of the municipal golf course, we found out that a total of 45 lots within the boundaries of the golf course actually belong to Palm Beach County. So at that point, in order for the city to move forward with the redevelopment of the golf course, we have to attain title to these lots and they have to be conveyed to the city by Palm Beach County. Um, the city, as you may know, is currently in, in discussions and negotiations with PGA of America to redevelop the golf course. It would include the redevelopment of the course, possibly some offices for PGA itself and a, what, they're, what they're describing as a teaching academy, a golf teaching academy. So we've had a series of discussions with Palm Beach County over the last few months, um, and a couple items have surfaced. Um, one in, in regard to Lot D, which is the subject of the next case that you'll hear. Um, Lot D is located catty-corner catty corner to Jeff Green's One West Palm Project Northbridge, immediately north of the Palm Beach County Governmental Center. Um, and then you see the second graphic down below here that shows <clears throat> lot D 
directly uh, north of their governmental complex. Um, Lot D is zoned Quadrille Garden District 10. It currently allows for 10 stories or 128 feet. Um, Palm Beach County has indicated to the city that they have a desire to possibly expand and develop this site either as a future administrative complex or a potential second courthouse, um, but they sought a building in excess of 200 feet in height. Um, through TDRs right now, the, the building height can be increased to 15 stories, which would be 188 feet. It still did not achieve the 200 feet that the county desired. So if you remember last year, we brought forward an application to both DAC planning board and ultimately the city commission approved ordinance number 4883-19, which was approved last December, which allowed an additional 10 feet in height for a governmental building that would allow a development on this site to go to 206.7 feet. Um, and again, that's the subject of the next request. What I'll be discussing today is actually the administrative complex immediately to the south. Um, that, <clears throat> that particular building was built in 1972. It has 285,000 square feet. It's currently assessed at about $48 million through the property appraiser's office. Um, the building currently has a height of 12 stories, 176 feet. And again, under the Quadrille Garden District 10 zoning, they are allowed 10 stories or 128 feet under today's DMP. So the structure today is considered a legal non-conforming grandfathered structure. It's allowed to continue. The concern expressed by Palm Beach County was that if there was significant damage to the structure, they would not be permitted to repair or rebuild the complex. Certainly the city's interest, if there was damage to the building, we obviously would love to see the building and would want to see the building repaired, reconstructed, whatever would be required. Um, so under the current language of the code, you see that um, a building could be redeveloped as long as it was started within 18 months of the date of, of construction. So I just received comments just this morning on the staff report that I forwarded to them a week ago um, so I made some last minute changes, which do not reflect exactly what's in the staff report. Um, so the additional language is reflected in the, in the green color. So we're changing the wording slightly to say the owner of a public facility destroyed by windstorm flood at the county's request, we're adding fire or other natural disaster may apply for a building permit for reconstruction so long as it is submitted to the building division within 18 months after the date of destruction. That is in line with what we have in our code today. The additional language reads, with the right to obtain a six month administrative time extension, and we've identified that extension would be granted by the planning and zoning administrator. So really the substantive change is we're adding another six month extension if it's needed as Palm Beach County did not feel that the 18 months was going to be sufficient time for them. Um, again, this was part of an interlocal agreement that was approved by the county and, and uh, West Palm Beach. We have four months to execute this language, which puts, puts the approval date with the commission sometime in mid-January. Again, we're well ahead of that time frame. Um, again, we don't see this as a, as a major issue. So staff is recommending approval of CRC case 20-05. It does meet all of the eight required amendment standards found in section 9432 as represented in your code. Our desire is to bring this to the planning board um, on October 20th next week, and then we'll bring it to the city commission sometime in November, December. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the interlocal agreement requires 120 days from the date of the approval of the interlocal agreement, which was September 21st, 2020, which again puts our deadline at some time in mid-January. Um, with that, that in completes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions the DAC may have. Thank you. Mr. Chegas. Uh, Rick, thanks for the presentation and, and the explanation. Couple quick questions. Um, it says in the interlocal agreement and it says in staff's report that this is um, uh, giving them the additional height, giving them the additional uh, density is based on destruction of the building or you know, you know, some kind of disaster. Is there a possibility that the, the county can 
um, declare their existing building functionally obsolete and be able to, to construct on the new site and keep that old building in place? Is there a possibility other than by natural disaster that um, some kind of functional obsolescence can come into play where they can hold on to the existing building and, and construct on parcel D? No, that's that's not that's not envisioned in this particular amendment. Um, this is simply in the case of a, any type of natural disaster. Sure. They, in essence, want to be able to rebuild what they had before. Um, okay. With regard to lot B, which Liz will address, um, what, what they will be permitted to do with the ordinance that was adopted by the commission last December is to build a building just under 207 feet, 15 stories. Um, but they're two separate cases. This one is simply addressing um, redevelopment of the Palm Beach Administrative Complex should it be damaged by some type of um, natural disaster. Thank you. Great. Are there any members of the public that wish to comment on this case? Mr. Vice Chair, I don't see any indication of anyone from the public now. Thank you, John. So are there any other comments or questions from the board members? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Hearing a motion and a second, I will ask all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Let the record show that CRC 20-05 has a unanimous vote for approval. Thank you all. Thank you. New cases. Number one, TDR 20-02, a request by the city of West Palm Beach and Palm Beach County for the DAC approval for the transfer of 110,000 square feet of city-owned development rights from the city-owned Gateway Park urban open space to the property at 351 Third Street, aka Block D, pursuant to the City of West Palm Beach Zoning and Land Development Regulations Article 4, Section 94-132 and Section 94-133. The property is located at 315 Third Street within Commission District Number Three, Commissioner Christy Fox. Ms. Levesque. Mr. Chair, before she begins, two things. Okay. One, we'll need to go ahead and swear her in for this item. And second, for the board, whomever makes the motion on this item will need to read the motion in its entirety. It's listed on page 85 of the board packet. Um, but Liz, and I don't know if Rick or Anna intends to speak, um, but if you'd like to be sworn in, raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're going to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Liz Levesque, Urban Design Planner. Good morning. Um, so this is a continuation of um, what Rick was just discussing. This is a TDR request for Block D, TDR case 2002. Um, so brief overview, I like to do this for some of the newer board members, um, like it quick, because I think everyone's seen it, but um, the intent of the TDR, Transfer of Development Rights Program, is to use market forces to pay for preservation of historic buildings and for creation of new public open space and developers can acquire rights that can be used to increase development potential at a more suitable location. This program only applies to qualified programs, uh, properties, excuse me, located within the downtown master plan area. And the property is deemed qualified if it's designated as an eligible sending site or receiving site on figure 4-35 shown here. The receiving site is Palm Beach County owned block D north of County Governmental Center and the Palm Beach History Museum. It is within the QGD 10 to 15 receiving district. And the county wishes to obtain a development rights for a future public facility on this lot. The interlocal agreement that was discussed was signed between Palm Beach County and the city of West Palm Beach on September 21st, 2020 through resolution 26720. 
in this was the agreement to transfer 110,000 square feet of city owned TDRs. These will be non revocable, they shall not expire, and they shall run with the land. The sending site is 1025 Okeechobee Boulevard, it's Gateway Park, shown here on Okeechobee Boulevard and the on ramp to South Australian Avenue. Currently, this site has 439,120 square feet to transfer. Section 94.133 does permit that the city can provide development rights at no cost, um, not associated with uh, any specific incentive. City commission, commission approval is required, but this has already been approved through the signing of this interlocal agreement. The development capacity for the site, the total lot size is 132,858 square feet. FAR allowed by right is 2.75. Additional FAR with the TDRs in the QG 10 to 15 is one for a total development capacity of 3.75 FAR around 498,217 square feet. The county is requesting 110,000 square feet for future public facilities. So no site plan is in right now for that facility. This is just for the future. And after this transfer, the Gateway Park will have 329,120 square feet of remaining development rights to transfer. And with that, staff is recommending approval for the transfer of 110,000 square feet from city-owned Gateway Park to the property at 315 Third Street. And that's all, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Are there any members of the public that wish to speak about this case? Mr. Rice here, I don't see where anyone has expressed interest, no. Thank you, John. So I'll turn it over then to the board for any questions. Mr. Chair. Yes, Brian. Uh, just a quick uh, question, uh, Mr. Lake. Um, in, in the packet, um, the table one, um, it's referencing Flagler Station development capacity. I'm assuming that's just a Scrivener's error. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry, would not let me unmute. Um, it, that was an error. That was an error from um, from a past. Okay. Our staff report. Very in that same table, um, so the total development capacity is just the total lot size times the FAR, um, but plus the the FAR. So it's four ninety eight two eighteen. Just looks like a small Scribner error. Is that? If she 498 218, I think, is the, is the final number. 498 218? Yeah, I believe. Just wanted to point that out. Just so that the, the table is corrected for passing on to the planning board and further on. Okay, um, I can check. I mean, the, the, that'll be corrected and, you know, it, we have an approximate total lot size too, so everything will be corrected when they um, when they actually come in. So this, but um, and this doesn't go forward to planning board or commission. Commission's already seen, and they they care more about what is actually being requested to transfer, not that exact amount. But I appreciate it. It was thank you. Yeah. And Brian, I think the intent here is that with Gateway Park, we started with a million square feet of, of development rights on that parcel. We've been divvying up that. Um, those TDRs to different projects prior to this moving forward. We had 439,000 square feet of TDRs remaining. This will take another 110,000. And then you've got Flagler Station. Um, the Grand is coming in, is seeking TDRs. And then um, ultimately the first Church of Christ scientists will be getting TDRs for that site. So we're just keeping a running track. And that's kind of what this table was trying to show. Thanks. Great. Quick question. Um, Go ahead. When the um, Gateway Park TDRs are uh, used up, is there another bank that the city has, or is that is that it? 
there, there won't be any that the city will have. So at that point, anybody seeking TDR, TDRs will have to venture into the private market and acquire them through private interest. Okay, interesting. So uh, just as an FYI, Stacy, I have uh, tried to pan down to page 85 of the SharePoint packet, but um, I don't know if it is my computer, but the sheets are all white. As we get closer to someone making a motion, your reminder of reading that full copy there um, having to be done. I'm not sure. Do, do all board members have the full report? Might be just my computer. Mr. Cherry, are you ready for a motion? He doesn't have this page. I am, uh, with a group? reminder that, uh, thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. So the person, uh, yeah. go ahead, Brian. Yep. Um, granting transfer development rights. I move that downtown action committee approve the transfer development rights DAC case number TDR 20-02 as listed in the staff report dated October 14, 2020 as follows. A, the transfer of 110,000 square feet of TDRs from the city owned Gateway Park at 1025 Okeechobee Boulevard to the Palm Beach County owned block B located at 315 Third Street pursuant to the requirements of section 94-132 and section 94-133. Second. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, let the record reflect that case TDR 20-02 has a unanimous approval. Next on the agenda is unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business? Mr. Chair, I just would like to mention that um, our fiscal year um, just ended on September 30th. And despite COVID, I'm pleased to say that the Development Services Department came in just under $2 million ahead of our budgeted revenues. Um, we collected a little over $17 million between our building division, planning and code enforcement and business tax. Um, last year we set a record, but that number of 17 million we just collected was higher than any other fiscal year with the exception of last year. So we've been staying quite busy despite COVID. Um, and yes, we did experience a little bit of a drop, but it's amazing. We have $700 million worth of projects under construction as we speak, another 400 million in plan review right now. So uh, I think West Palm Beach is well situated. Um, across the country, and we're seeing a lot of development continuing. So I just wanted to pass that on. Rick, oh, that's great to hear. Great to hear. Yeah, it is fantastic. Uh, since you mentioned the uh, Church of Christ Scientist site briefly there, um, do we have any sort of new activity with that project? Um, we are working with related and law on some issues there. Um, there's still a lot going on right now, so nothing is gonna be happening in the very immediate future, but um, we're still having discussions as to their timing and what they wanna do. So not, nothing firm at this point. And uh, just since I have you, um, one uh, West Palm project, uh, is there any further discussions, negotiations with the city and Mr. Green uh, at this time? Um, we, we have done an analysis, the city has done an analysis, um, looking at the project that was approved in 2016 by, by DAC, um, which again, as you know, is a mixture of class A office, hotel and residential. Um, there has been discussion on Mr. Green's part about revising that and reducing the amount of office, increasing the number of residential. And then, as you know, when he stopped construction, he talked about doing exclusively residential. So the city did an analysis based on what he originally had approved and the value that building would have and how much tax revenue the city would derive in comparison to doing an all residential project. And there was certainly a, 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 a difference in what happens if you go all residential at, at, at the loss to the city of, of several million dollars. So we presented that information back to Mr. Green. I think he's weighing his options now. Um, at this point, 
Um, I'm not sure how he wants to proceed. I've heard that he might just continue the project, but at a slower pace. Um, we are still having discussions with him. If he wants to do exclusively residential, the city would be expecting something in return for that. So I think those discussions are ongoing. Um, in the meantime, Anna and I and Liz are all working on a, an incentive um, for workforce housing because we see that as our biggest need right now. In our downtown master plan right now, as you all know, in the Quadrille Garden District, we have incentives for Class A office, full service hotels, um, residential developments, but we have nothing on workforce housing. So we expect that by February, we will be bringing to DAC um, a new incentive that will um, address the workforce housing issue and provide either additional density or height like we've done with the other incentives. Um, we are weighing whether we need to retain the incentive for class A office and full service hotels. So the thought is that we might get rid of those now with you know, 360 Rosemary coming online, Jeff Green's One West Palm project, One Flagler being approved. So I think we're gonna be well situated for class A office and, and we'll take a look at the full service hotel requirement as well. But the DAC will be seeing something in the near future, probably early next year um, on a workforce housing incentive that we would apply to probably most, if not all of our districts downtown. Thank you for that update, appreciate it. Mr. Chair, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Rick, real fast. I don't know who did it, but thank you for paving Flagler um, from from Clematis uh, uh, North because it's finally drivable. Yeah, that was part of the uh, of the Flagler Banyan Square project. That was something that we had planned on doing, and the, the developer there chipped in on doing one of the lanes there. Great. Okay, next is new business. Any new business? And next is other business. Any other business? None that I'm aware of, no. And finally is, okay, thank you. Well, appreciate everybody's contribution and attendance and comments. Uh, good meeting. And uh, here's my air gavel to adjourn. Click.